This is how I visited 10 cities in only 18 days in Japan, so let's just get into it. Day 1 Our great adventure across Japan started at Narita Airport just outside of Tokyo. It took me 2 hours to get through all the airport stuff like customs, immigration, picking up baggage, and getting my pocket Wi-Fi, as well as getting the JR Pass, which I would use throughout the trip. The JR Pass is a ticket which I purchased in advance, and it let me ride on all the JR trains just by scanning my ticket, and it was a huge lifesaver and it definitely saved some money, however it's not going to save people so much money when the prices increase in October. Then I boarded the Sleep Narita Express train to take us into the city of Tokyo. I was lucky to be able to reserve seats in the green car which is the first class section in each JR train since I had the pass, and it was empty because usually the green car gets quite full as you'll see later on in the trip. I was treated to beautiful sunset views of Japan as we traveled through the countryside, crossed a couple of bridges, and then eventually we made it to Tokyo. My train arrived at Tokyo Station and then it took me 15 minutes to exit the station since it was a bit confusing since it's such a large station. I also really love the classic exterior of Tokyo Station. Then I walked over to my hotel which was the Gate Hotel by Hulik. I loved the location as it was right across from Ginza Station. I thought the hotel lobby, as well as my room, was very nice and a bit on the fancy side. Believe it or not, my favorite part of the room was the bathroom as it was so large and spacious. Then I took the local JR train back to Tokyo Station to look for dinner. I originally had a sushi place planned out, but I couldn't find it and I was really searching for it for an hour because Tokyo Station is just a maze and I eventually decided on this udon shop instead. The udon was thoroughly enjoyable as it was freshly made and it made for a great first meal in Japan. About halfway through the meal I got incredibly tired and I almost fell asleep while eating my meal but eventually I made it back to the hotel and I basically crashed as soon as I made it back that night. Day 2 This was my first full day in Tokyo. I started the morning by taking the subway for the first time using my Suica card which I picked up the night before. This was a must-have as I could use this card to pay for pretty much any public transportation that wasn't run by JR, so it was very convenient just to tap and go everywhere. I eventually made it to the shopping center underneath the Tokyo Sky Tree as there was this conveyor belt sushi place that I wanted to check out and I really ended up enjoying it, however it was a long wait. I got a variety of sushi ranging from uni which I wasn't a big fan of due to its rich and deep irony taste to broiled tuna which was just melt in your mouth and perfect. After lunch I headed over to Shibuya Sky which is a popular observation deck in Tokyo that almost everybody goes to. The elevator ride up to the top was really quite cool so it was really dark with lights inside. From the observation deck you could see marvelous views of Tokyo and it was really quite a sight. It is also popular to take photos there but make sure you have enough time because it gets really crowded and I didn't really have enough time because I only spent about an hour there and it was so crowded so definitely give yourself 2 hours to check it out. Shibuya Sky is also famous for their glass escalator which gives you beautiful views of the city but my favorite view was of Shibuya Scramble which is one of the busiest intersections in Japan. Then I realized I was late for my dinner reservation so I raced over to Zao which is famous for their fishing restaurant experience. I used a fishing pole and bait to catch my fish and I'm not exaggerating when I say it only took me 5 seconds to catch it. It was literally so easy and so much fun. I got a course that came with options such as fish hot pot, grilled fish, and deep fried fish. All were quite delicious and overall it was just a fun experience. As it was almost my birthday I told them that it was my birthday and they gave me a special birthday cake which was really cool. Eventually I arrived back at my hotel but surprisingly jet lag wasn't too bad. Day 3 I started the day by taking the metro to Sakasa as I had reservations at a kimono shop however I ended up getting lost. I ended up getting off at Akasaka station instead of Asakusa station so definitely be careful when you're reading the signs because they look very similar and even sound similar. I eventually made it to the kimono shop 20 minutes late, changed it into my kimono and then I walked over to Nakamise Dori which is the famous street of Asakusa. I then tried various street treats such as rice crackers, mochi, waffles filled with red bean paste, a fruit sandwich, and a giant fried chicken. Then a professional photographer took pictures of me and my kimono and I thought they turned out really nice and afterwards I stopped by this famous melon palm place which I thought was pretty nice. I love the fluffy texture of the buns however I do think they could have been a little bit sweeter. Afterwards I went back to the train station to make ticket reservations for the bullet train that I would be taking in a couple of days and good thing I did because it was almost full. 
After that, I went to my favorite soft serve shop in Tokyo, Hokkaido Dosanka Plaza, which is known for their Hokkaido soft serve. Since I went there 7 years ago for the first time, I literally had dreams about it for years as their ice cream was so creamy, it was the best soft serve I ever had. The ice cream did not disappoint, but the most unbelievable thing is I found even better ice cream later on in the trip when I actually visited Hokkaido, so stay tuned for that. Dinner that night was at an incredible yakiniku place which I found by just exploring the streets of Tokyo. I ordered one of their most popular courses which came with 8 different cuts of premium beef as well as even some wagyu, and I thought the price was really affordable because it only costed $103 for 3 people which I think is almost unbeatable when it comes to high quality beef and wagyu in Japan. After dinner I immediately walked back to the hotel and fell asleep quite quickly. Day 4 I started the morning off at breakfast at my hotel and this was the first time that I recorded it, however I had it the previous couple of days. The way it worked is it was an all you can eat buffet and they also let you order one dish, I decided to go for the french toast with bacon which was just heavenly and I thought it was a really great deal as it was only $25 a person for what felt like a luxury hotel buffet and like I said it was all you can eat as well. The highlight for sure was this giant block of honeycomb which I spread over freshly baked bread and my gosh it was the best honey I've ever had and this is coming from someone who's eaten a lot of high quality honey over the years. After breakfast I took the Yuriko Momoe line which is my favorite train line in Tokyo as I love the scenic views of the city. My favorite part is crossing over the rainbow bridge as you get panoramic views of Tokyo. Eventually I made it to Odaiba and my destination was Team Lab Planets Tokyo which is a really interactive art museum and experience. For many parts of the experience you walk through water, they also have this room where you cross through a giant bean bag and everyone falls down which is kind of crazy. One of the most mesmerizing rooms was a giant room full of LED lights and I thought it was really colorful and I just couldn't take my eyes off of every single light. Another highlight is their famous flower room which is a giant room full of fresh flowers and it's really popular to take pictures there. The only unfortunate thing is you only have about 5 minutes or so to spend there but it is really enjoyable. I definitely worked up an appetite at Team Labs so I headed over to Gonpachi Odaiba for lunch which is a yakitori shop and I absolutely loved their yakitori the last time I was there. What I didn't realize is they only serve yakitori for dinner but it was no big deal because I decided to get their fresh soba so I got a little soba set instead and I loved their smoked duck soba as it was so smoky and rich and it was definitely a great replacement for the yakitori. Afterwards I decided to get my caricature at the mall that Gompachi is located at just like I did 7 years ago and I thought my caricature turned out really nicely. Then I was back on the Yurikomomi line and I left Odaiba back for Tokyo and I was there to check out this really cool ice cream shop. This ice cream shop specializes in 7 different levels of matcha gelato. That means the higher the level, the higher the strength of matcha. So they have this really dark matcha ice cream. This was such an interesting experience as it was easily the darkest matcha ice cream I've ever had and it's definitely a place to check out if you love matcha as much as me. Dinner was at this Yukatsu place that I saw a ton of different YouTubers go to and they all loved it so I was looking forward to it. Yukatsu is a beef cutlet that's breaded in breadcrumbs and deep fried before you grill it at your table side and it was so interesting. It was really crispy on the outside and I loved the juicy interior of the meat. While it is delicious I would recommend you don't over order like I did because I felt a little bit sick afterwards as it was so rich and a little bit heavy on the fat however I recovered quickly. It was a good thing that I felt better because I had to go to bed really early that night. I was able to get to bed at 8pm since I had to wake up early the next morning to go to Miyajima Island which was our next destination. Day 5 This day I had to wake up super early as I was going to Miyajima Island and as I walked the streets of Tokyo they were deserted because it was that early. Eventually I made it to my bullet train which I would be taking to Hiroshima Station. I made the slightly crazy decision to upgrade to the Zomi train as it left really early in the morning and I wanted to get to Miyajima early which meant that I had to pay for it out of pocket as it was not covered with the JR pass but I think it ended up being worth it. Even though I was in a blue car and I probably should have been in a green car on a later train, my seat was still very comfortable and I really enjoyed seeing the morning light shine off of Tokyo's large skyscrapers. The true power of the Japanese Shinkansen never fails to amaze me at how fast it goes. Literally everything passes by you in a blur, buildings almost morph together as you go at warp speeds. 
It's also really cool as you go through small stations, as they are literally there for about 2 seconds before you threw them and gone. I was also lucky enough to be on the right side of the train, so I got a beautiful view of Mount Fuji, which is the famous view on the Shinkansen. It was also really cool to hear the train is accelerated, just to hear the wind and feel the power, and it was strangely addicting. As long as I live, I will never get tired of riding the bullet train. It was so nice seeing all the scenery, but we eventually arrived at Hiroshima Station. At Hiroshima Station, I had to transfer to the Sanyo Line, which was a local train, and that would take us about 20 minutes to the ferry station that would eventually take us to Miyajima Island. As I arrived at the ferry station and approached the ferry, I had this internal excitement I can't describe because I was so excited to go to Miyajima Island as it was one of my most anticipated places I would visit on a trip. The ferry docking process was so efficient and it literally only took 5 minutes which I found extremely impressive. Little cars came zipping off the ferry and the people came off right behind them literally running off the ferry so I think everyone was in a hurry. It was an amazing feeling to be on that ferry with the morning fog in the air as we approached to Miyajima Island. As I approached the giant Tori gate welcoming us to the island, I already knew that I would have a great time in Miyajima on my trip and it would be one of the most memorable moments. When I arrived, I made a short walk through the ferry station and then I was able to call the hotel shuttle which took us all the way to our Ryokan Iwaso. I was really amazed to see our 169 year old hotel for the first time, but I just made a quick stop to drop off our bags and then I walked through the rainy streets of Miyajima off to lunch. While I'm not usually a big fan of rain as I hate getting wet, I will admit it was very peaceful walking through the very quiet island just with the sound of the rain pitter pattering against the ground. I did some research ahead of time and found this place that serves conger eel rice bowls and I was really looking forward to it because I love unagi which is freshwater eel which tends to be a little bit fattier but conger eel is saltwater eel which means it's a little bit more lean and it's really hard to find so I was looking forward to trying it. And boy was the taste exquisite, sweet tender eel with a rich smoky flavor from the charcoal grill with a sweet sticky sauce served over rice, just pure heaven. After lunch, I carefully walked through the rain trying to not get my camera wet as it was pouring. I even saw this huge group of students on a field trip which I thought was pretty amazing. I even saw a deer as the island is famous for having feral deer and they were all pretty friendly. A block away from my Ryokan, I discovered a shop selling Hiroshima lemonade. The lady working there was super friendly and we spent a few minutes chatting with her and I thought it was a really great experience. Now let's talk about the lemonade. I was at a loss of words after the first sip. It was so light and refreshing and it had the perfect balance of tartness and sweetness and it was also extremely fragrant and almost tasted like lemon zest. I was even able to eat the lemon slices in there which were really sweet and not bitter or sour at all. This was easily the best lemonade I've ever had. It's just uncomparable to any other lemonade. I then arrived back in my Ryokan and we walked in and checked into our room and I loved the room. It really had a traditional feel to it, however it did seem a bit small, but it was definitely part of the traditional experience. I then had afternoon tea in a room which was quite nice. That night dinner was at the hotel and I was excited to try the authentic Kaseki dinner which is a multi-course experience. I had some beautiful appetizers to start off the meal and I loved the presentation of these kaiseki meals as they're so artistic. To be quite honest, the oyster I tried here was the grossest food I ate on a trip. For me it was a textural thing because it was just way too soft and slimy which I think is an acquired taste that many Japanese people like and it was also really intense and briny which I know some people like but it was just a bit too much for me and I had to drink a lot of water afterwards. However, there were many other delightful dishes such as wagyu stew as well as tofu pudding for dessert. All in all, the Kaiseki dinner is an experience that I'll never forget and is something that you have to try when you're in Japan. After dinner, I enjoyed the view from my room as I had one of the only rooms with a view of the giant Tori gate. Day 6 I woke up to beautiful morning view of Miyajima. Then I headed down to breakfast and I thought this Kaiseki breakfast was even better than a dinner the night before. 
After breakfast, I took the ropeway to the top of Mount Mason, and the view was already amazing. It was great to see the island with the beautiful ocean shining in the distance. Then I took the hike up Mount Mason, and it was great seeing all the scenery like the forest and the trees. Halfway up, I got to see the eternal flame which has been burning for 1200 years straight, which I find kind of crazy. Then it was just a little bit further until we reached the summit. Once reaching the top, you just have a beautiful view of Hiroshima and the surrounding area. For me, it was so worth it to hike to the top, and I really felt like I had accomplished something great. Then I hiked back down the mountain and headed to the famous shopping street for lunch, where there's so many different restaurants and shops. For lunch, I found this oyster restaurant, as oysters are a Miyajima specialty, and celebrities like Ronald Reagan have even gone here. These were the largest oysters I've ever eaten, they were so fresh, plump, and juicy, and were infinitely times better than a raw oyster I had the night before. These were so enjoyable. After lunch I stopped by this shop next door, and I got these bear shaped waffles that were strawberry flavored, and they were so cute and delicious. As I walked down the street I passed the sweet potato ice cream shop, and I heard someone inviting me in, and I looked over, and it was the same lady that I saw the previous day that was working at the lemonade shop, and she also worked the second job at the sweet potato ice cream shop. Once again we talked for a few minutes, and I really enjoyed it. This is what I love about traveling, when you meet new people and you get to find out a lot more about them and their culture. Just like the Hiroshima lemonade, the sweet potato ice cream was mind-blowing. It was the sweetest sweet potato I ever had, and it almost had a caramely texture and taste to it. It seems that whatever shop this lady works at, she'll bring her bubbly personality with her and prepare you some truly amazing food. Right next door I tried the shop's honeycomb soft serve, which was delightful. Then I went to way too many places for momiji manju, which are basically little cakes filled with red bean paste. Some of them were even deep fried which had a really crispy texture, and I also tried one without being fried. All of them were indulgently delicious and it's definitely something to try in Miyajima. Next I walked over to the legendary Itsukashima Shrine, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Itsukashima Shrine stands in front of 1400 year old Tori Gate, and I was even able to walk out there because it was low tide and I decided to touch the gate which was really cool. Dinner was a kaseki meal back at the hotel and I loved the fresh and colorful dishes and it was a great way to end off the night. Day 7 I woke up to the beautiful view of Miyajima for the last time as I would be heading to Hiroshima later that morning. It was also my 18th birthday so I was officially 18 years old finally. I enjoyed one last kaseki breakfast before saying goodbye to Iwaso. I then boarded the fury and took it back across the water. Once again, I took the Sonya line and I was on my way back to Hiroshima Station. The next stop is Hiroshima. After arriving at Hiroshima Station, I dropped my bags off at the hotel, which was literally right across from the station. I boarded the bus right outside our hotel and I took that to Okonomimura, which is a popular okonomiyaki spot. Okonomimura is a food hall with various shops selling their versions of okonomiyaki, a savory Japanese pancake. I finally decided on this shop which specializes in fried squid okonomiyaki. Okonomiyaki is one of my favorite Japanese foods and it was really fascinating to see them build it as I've never had an okonomiyaki that was this complex with so many different ingredients and it was almost like a treasured art form. I also thought it was insane that they topped it with so many green onions as I know it takes a long time to cut those up. The taste of this okonomiyaki was phenomenal and you could really taste all the hard work and every single layer that was a part of it. The okonomiyaki was even better than I hoped it would be, and it just blew my expectations out of the water. After lunch, I headed to the Atomic Bomb Dome, which was a solemn moment for me, and I think it's a really important memorial that everybody needs to see if they're in Japan, and especially if they're in Hiroshima. After checking into my hotel room, which had another gorgeous view of the city, I changed, and then I was back on a bullet train to head to my birthday dinner in Kobe, which would be A5 Wagyu Kobe Beef. The restaurant had a really cool vibe to it, and the best part of it is it was a teppanyaki style piece with a grill right in front of you. 
It has always been on my bucket list to travel to Kobe, Japan and try the famous Kobe A5 Wagyu beef and I'm so glad that my dream was able to come true that night. The chef was crazy and even lit the beef on fire with a little bit of brandy and it made for quite the spectacle. The steak was almost indescribably delicious and was different than any other Wagyu I've ever had in the past because it was a sirloin steak so it was much more lean and had such a rich beefy flavor and you could really tell that it was high quality Kobe beef and you really taste the difference. Dessert was a multi-layer treat which was super colorful and looked artistically made. Once I made it back on a train I thought about my day and it was definitely one of the most memorable birthdays I've ever had. As the lights of the city faded away, I started to feel really tired because of all that delicious wagyu and I just fell into a deep food coma and although I didn't want to, I immediately fell asleep. What's scary is the only thing that woke me up were the bright city lights of Hiroshima because both of my parents were still asleep. The terrifying reality is that if I continued to sleep and didn't wake up, the train would have gone on to Kagoshima in Kyushu, which is 3 hours down the track, and it would have arrived at 2am, and I don't know what I would have done then. After my near disastrous nap, I made it back to the hotel, and then I went promptly to sleep. Day 8 This morning I woke up early once again as I was heading to the airport to go to Sapporo, so I booked it over to the airport bus which was right outside Hiroshima Station. It was a short one hour ride to the airport which went by really quickly seeing all the lush mountains go by. Since I got to the airport early I had time to do some last minute shopping so I picked up some snacks for some friends as well as my dog Oreo. I also made a stop at the observation deck and saw one plane land. I flew Japan Airlines economy class and I thought it was comfortable for a two hour flight. The scenery was quite nice as we left Hiroshima however it was quite foggy so we didn't get to see too much. However, when we came down to land in Hokkaido, I got to see the beautiful countryside which was really quite nice. Before I knew it, we were back on the ground and the flight was definitely the way to go since it was such a long distance. The new Chitose airport is easily the best airport I've ever gone to as it's huge. It's basically a giant shopping mall full of restaurants and shops and it's just an experience. For lunch, I went to their ramen street which is a collection of ramen shops and I had some incredible pork and miso ramen that tasted just as good as ramen you could find in the city. Then I had an experience that I'll never forget. I had farm fresh authentic Hokkaido milk ice cream for the first time and it was insane. Hokkaido ice cream in Hokkaido just tastes so much better, it's fresher and it just has this really rich and intense dairy flavor. I also saw Roy's Chocolate World which was a chocolate factory inside the airport and where else in the world can you find a chocolate factory inside of an airport making high quality chocolate. As it was getting late in the afternoon I decided to make my way to the airport train station and hopped on the train which would take us into the city of Sapporo. For some reason this train did have a little bit of dirty windows and I find that very unusual because usually the trains in Japan are spotless. Either way I made it to Sapporo station safely and then I had to lug all of my luggage through the station and definitely pro tip is look for the elevators because I ended up carrying it through stairs however I definitely utilized the elevators later on in a the trip. Then I checked into my hotel which was only $128 a night and that considered I thought the room was pretty good for that value. Then I experienced a 6.0 earthquake. The whole building started shaking and the antenna on the nearby building started flapping around at a 90 degree angle but luckily there is no damage caused and everyone in Hokkaido including myself was okay. After my earthquake scare I headed to the Susakino area for dinner and I tried out this popular soup curry shop The soup curry is a popular Hokkaido specialty. The soup curry was so warm and comforting and I really enjoyed all the toppings that I was able to add into it. That night I went to bed quickly as I had an exciting itinerary planned for the next day. Day 9. I was exactly halfway through my time in Japan so I decided to sleep in a little bit longer as I hadn't been getting enough sleep and I got up at about 10am and then I went down to breakfast. The all you can eat breakfast buffet was included in the price of our room for $128 a night which I thought was pretty insane because for $128 a night I got that room as well as all this high quality food and everything was so delicious it even had Hokkaido pudding and yogurt. I got a nice plate with a wide variety of food and one of the highlights was the glass of Hokkaido milk I got. But it was already time for lunch as I had woken up so late so I decided to hop on the subway and then I headed to the next spot which was this restaurant that specialized in giant live king crabs. I was able to select my king crab out of a tank and then they pulled it out and weighed it before cooking it up for me and I decided to order it grilled. 
The crab was a little dangerous to eat as he had to cut through the spiky shell with scissors, but it was so worth it. The crab leg soaked up a really nice smoky flavor from the grill and was so tender and sweet and the claw was sweet on a whole nother level. This was the second best crab I had in my entire life and I found the best crab later on on the trip. Then I headed to Mitsukoshi, a luxury Japanese department store. The cool thing about Japanese department stores is they're so much different than American department stores. They have multiple floors for shopping, however the bottom two floors are easily reserved for only food and it is a foodie paradise so it's my favorite area to go to. My favorite section was the luxury fruit area and simply put, it was insane. They have all sorts of different fruits wrapped up in shiny plastic and under a spotlight just like jewelry. The most expensive fruit I could find is a $110 melon and I really want to know who is buying those. I eventually got this bunch of 30 grace for $30 because I don't know when I would ever try it again. For dinner I went to Sol Kier Genghis Khan Lamb Barbecue Place and I was looking forward to this meal because I've heard the lamb here is really good and has no gimme flavor at all. The lamb was unlike anything I had before, it was so juicy the second you bit into it and it had almost a sweet flavor to it and I think that's because of the salt curing which removed all the gaminess. I was also really excited to see lamb tongue as I love beef tongue and it had a really nice fattiness to it. After dinner I decided to head to an ice cream shop that I found online. Before I went on my trip I did a little bit of research for milk soft serve and this place popped up when I dug really deep and it seems like Queen Soft Cream Cafe, as the place was called, was a little bit more obscure. The location was quite interesting as it was in the Esta building which is some sort of shopping mall but it was actually really good ice cream. I finally made it back to the hotel to try out those $30 grapes and they were so sweet and fragrant and really had a luxurious taste to it and I could see why people are willing to pay a lot of money. Although it was 30 bucks for about 30 grapes, I do think I would buy it again in the future but maybe only for a special occasion. I finally made it to bed at about 11.30pm which wasn't great since I had an early morning the next day but oh well. Day 10 On day 10 I went to the town of Ferrano for their famous flower fields. I first had to get to Sapporo Station and I boarded the most crowded subway train in the trip and I'm not exaggerating when I had to push my way in and then as I walked through the station it was ridiculously crowded and everyone was packed in like sardines. I then took the sleek looking lilac express to Asiakawa and I loved the view as we passed through the countryside. On my way to Asahikawa I passed through some of the most deserted towns I had ever seen in Hokkaido. For example, this town I passed through, I did not see a single person in the entire town. It was creepy. There was not a single person driving in their car, not a single person walking on the sidewalks of this town, and not even a single soul at the train station. Either way, I finally made it to Asiakawa for lunch, and I'm not really counting it as the 10 cities I visited on this trip since it was super short, since I just stopped for a quick lunch at a small ramen shop near the station. I got this gigantic bowl of shoyu ramen which is the biggest bowl of ramen I ever had and it was pretty tasty. Then I took this little one car train that looked like something out of a Studio Ghibli movie to Ferrano. This is literally the smallest station I've ever seen as it was a little strip of gravel in the middle of nowhere. After a short ride from Ferrano station I made it to Farm Tomita which is a popular area to see flower fields. They are particularly known for their lavender, however they also have many other different types of flowers and it was really nice seeing them in a rain, so it was a bit cold and wet, but it was really nice to hear the patter of the rain and see all the flowers blowing the breeze. While I was there I had to try their famous lavender soft serve and it was aromatic and delicious. I didn't have too much time at the farm and I had to head back to Sapporo so I got back on the one car train and took that back to Asiakawa. In order to not miss my train back to Sapporo I had to eat dinner at the mall inside of Asiakawa station and I settled for pepper lunch which is a Japanese fast food chain. I got this giant sizzling platter of beef and rice for only $10. Considering how cheap it was it was actually really tasty and it tasted like pretty good quality beef. Once again I fell asleep on the train after dinner and I barely woke up right before making it to Sapporo and then when I transferred back to the subway I almost fell asleep on there too but somehow I made it back to the hotel in one piece and I was able to get the best sleep of my life that night. Day 11 On day 11 I head to Nabori Betsu which is famous for Jingo Kudani or Hell Valley. Hell Valley is basically the sulfur geyser area that has a hellish landscape hence its name. In order to get there I had to take another 2 hour train ride. I even saw Hokkaido cows. But the fun started when I arrived in Nabori Betsu. 
After arriving at the Bori Betsy station, I figured the best way to get to Hell Valley was by taxi, and luckily a taxi was waiting for us right in front of the station. The taxi driver asked us where we wanted to go, and we told him Hell Valley, and he just cackled, and then he sped off in a hurry, and he was literally going down a road at flying speeds, and he actually went 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. Hell Valley definitely looked like you were on another planet and was super cool. There were danger signs all over the place, with boiling water just trickling feet away. There were also a couple of deer right next to the water and I'm not sure how they were able to handle the heat. For lunch I waited in line for an hour at a popular soba shop and I think it was worth it because it was clearly the best soba I had on the trip. I ordered the duck soba which came with tender smoky chunks of duck and an umami rich broth. The soba noodles were so smooth, chewy, and pleasant. For dessert, I went across the street to this ice cream shop that made soft serve ice cream out of Hokkaido dairy, and milk soft serve in Hokkaido never disappoints. I also couldn't resist stopping by this pudding shop and got their classic pudding, which came with a toasted sugar syrup. It essentially tasted like a smooth, light, and eerie creme brulee. And here's a clip of me explaining a crazy story of how I made it back to the train station. I just made it back to the station and I have a crazy story for you. I had only a few minutes to get to this train station before a train left, so I had to go back to the Hell Valley to go to the gift shop and they were able to call a taxi for us, but then we had to wait, so I was worried that we were going to miss our train. But thankfully, when we got our taxi pulled up, I was surprised because it was the same man that took us earlier to Hell Valley this morning, and you already know how he drives. As soon as we got in, he recognized us immediately, and I told him that we had to catch our train, and he just left and he drove as fast as he possibly could. He basically tailgated the car in front of us all the way to the station, so we ended up making it with a few minutes of spare, and then we found out that our train was delayed by 10 minutes, so now we have a few more minutes until our train gets here. For dinner, I took the train back to Sapporo, and then I wandered the streets for about 45 minutes before finally finding a yakitori place for dinner. Yakitori is charcoal grilled chicken skewers and is one of my favorite Japanese foods. I ordered a wide variety of skewers uncommon to westerners such as chicken heart, chicken tail, chicken gizzard, beef diaphragm, and even pork intestines. I find that these are some of the juiciest and tasty skewers on the menu and are what the Japanese frequently order. Don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone as you'll be in for an experience that you'll never forget. As I made it back to the hotel and got ready for bed, I thought about the next day, but I had no clue what amazing and special meals that I would end up having. Day 12. This was my last day in the Sapporo area, so I decided to take a short day trip to Otaru. The train ride was along the coast, and I will never tire of the natural beauty of Japan. For lunch, I picked a sushi place that looked good after looking around on Google reviews, and wow, it just shattered my expectations. This was definitely a defining food moment for me on the trip. Before this trip, I wasn't the biggest sushi person, probably because I never had the freshest sushi. However, with this experience, it just changed everything. All of the fish here basically tasted like you ate it out of the water and was so fresh and almost had a sweet taste to it with zero fishiness. Before this trip, I would have been scared to try sushi such as scallops or whelk, which is a carnivorous sea snail. I was pleasantly surprised by these, and the whelk had a really unique raw carrot-like texture. I was also scared of the salmon rose, I found it in the US to be very fishy. However, here it just had a gentle briny flavor. I was also wary of the squid, as the squid I had earlier on the trip was just way too slimy for me, but this squid had no sliminess, and just a perfect soft delicate texture. I was also fearful of the sea urchin as I had a traumatic experience with it 12 years ago when I tried it from an American grocery store. However, this one tasted completely different from even the other sea urchin I had in Japan as it was so sweet and had no brininess or irony flavor at all. What I really learned from this experience is no matter what foods you've had in the past, no matter how gross they are, you really need to give them a second chance and you will probably be surprised with how tasty they might actually be in a different form or in a different way. You really need to open up your mind and put yourself out there and then you will have new experiences that you could have never dreamed of in the past. After that life-changing experience, I went to an ice cream shop that served half a melon filled with soft serve ice cream. The melon was refreshing and sweet, but the ice cream was just okay and it didn't have a super strong dairy flavor. This just goes to show you that you won't love all food that you try, but it's part of the fun and journey. Afterwards, I went to a shop for their ponju, which is an old traditional Japanese confection, and this I loved. 
I also couldn't forget to stop by the famous Otoro Canal and it's a great place to relax by and is so picturesque. I also couldn't leave Otoro without getting one more milk ice cream and this definitely made up for the mediocre ice cream I had earlier. I also have a fun story for you to happen outside a spending machine back at the station. A friendly couple approached me as they noticed that I had this drink and they wanted to know what it was so I let them know it was the tea and that short interaction soon turned into a long meaningful conversation. They were both Filipinos living in Saudi Arabia and they told me about their entire trip and then I also shared with them my trip as well so I really enjoyed that interaction with them and they also found out that I was a YouTuber because they saw me recording a video with my camera and they were really excited to meet me so they took a selfie with me and then subscribed on the spot. If you're out there watching this video, just know that I really appreciate your generosity and meeting you just made my day. Dinner was back in Sapporo and I enjoyed some amazing Wagyu Shabu Shabu. Normally I wouldn't enjoy Wagyu more than once on a trip, but because of the good exchange rate, I thought why not treat myself. I definitely enjoyed my Wagyu as I knew it was a very special opportunity. As I made it back to the hotel that night, I felt so fulfilled as I felt like I had multiple once in a lifetime experiences that day. Day 13. This morning I woke up at 4am to sunrise in the land of the rising sun as I had to catch my train to Hakodate. I made it to Sapporo station to get on the train to Hakodate literally 5 minutes before rush hour. As soon as rush hour hit, it was just a horde and mass of people moving through the station at warp speeds. Then I stopped by the small stand for an Eki Ben, which is a bento eaten on the train. I decided to go for the Genghis Khan Grilled Lamb one. Now I have another cool story for you all that happened to me when I was on the train. Once I boarded the train, I sat down in my seat, which was the aisle seat, since the train was almost completely full and I was separated from both of my parents. I really wanted to get some nice footage of the scenery on a train ride, so I had to awkwardly sort of zoom in on a window, and it didn't turn out that great. Around this time, the 85-year-old gentleman sitting next to my dad asked him if he wanted to switch seats with me as he knew that we were part of a family. We were eventually able to change seats at the next station and I think to multiple times. He seemed like a genuinely nice guy who just wanted to practice his English with us and he told us that his children were all grown up now so he understood that we were traveling together as a family. We exchanged business cards and then a minute later he pulled up my YouTube channel and subscribed and then showed it to my mom and we were both really impressed by his kindness once again. I was so impressed by everything that he did for me, I gave him some chocolates that I got in the Bay Area and these I saved for people that I would meet along the trip as I knew I would find some really kind individuals just like him. As I gave him multiple chocolate bars, he felt bad that I gave him something and he felt obligated to give me something in return so he gave me a CD and that is just a Japanese way of saying that you're grateful for someone. These are the moments I really enjoy in life, even though we live on the other side of the world and we have very different cultures, we are still able to connect on a personal level and learn a lot about each other. Then I enjoyed my lamb bento for lunch and I was really impressed with how fresh and delicious it was and there's really nothing like enjoying a bento while watching the Japanese countryside go by on a train. In a blink of an eye our train ride to Hakodate was almost over as we passed through the city. Moments later we pulled into Hakodate station. From the train station I just walked over to my hotel to drop off my bag since it was too early to check in. Then I hopped on a streetcar and took a short ride to head to the Mount Hakodate Ropeway Station. I was looking forward to taking the ropeway up to the top of Mount Hakodate for scenic views of the city. I really enjoyed the view and looking out you could really see how large the surrounding area was as well as the city of Hakodate itself. There was even a cool area where you could see the Hokkaido Shinkansen which I would be taking the next day. I eventually head down the mountain as it was time to check into our hotel. I thought the hotel was really nice, the interior of the room was very modern and I loved the space in there. The room also had an amazing view of the morning market right outside. I was getting hungry so I walked over to dinner which was literally a block away. This restaurant specialized in live seafood and they had so many different tanks of live seafood such as sea cucumber, oysters, and all sorts of other goodies. They even had live squid. 
I couldn't resist the urge and I picked out a giant snow crab from the tank to eat. I ordered the snow crab grilled and wow, it was just so sweet I didn't even believe it was real because that's how sweet it was. This was the best crab I ate in my entire life. I will remember this moment forever. I also had some other delightful seafood treats such as the live squid that was out of the tank and I got that grilled with a little bit of teriyaki sauce and I also had the biggest mackerel I'd ever seen. This was just a ridiculous seafood meal, definitely the best seafood meal I've had in my entire life as well. I went to bed that night still in wonder of that snow crab and fresh seafood. Day 14 I knew this would be a great day since 14 is my lucky number. I started the morning by walking to the morning market, and you really can't start a morning in Hakodate without checking out the morning market. I tried some dried squid which was interesting to say the least. I also explored the indoor market where I bought these 10 strawberries for $10, and a slice of Yubari melon which is Hokkaido's most popular melon. The melon was just out of this world juicy, it was like a huge mouthful of fragrant melon juice. The flavor of this melon was just unmatched to any melon you can get in the US. I also saw this crazy restaurant with a tank full of live squid and they all looked so healthy and well. The owner was really friendly and convinced me to eat there and she handed me a fishing pole and I was able to catch my own squid right out of the tank and you won't believe what happened, it literally sneezed on me and just squirted snot all over me. I had the squid as sashimi and it was literally so fresh the tentacles were still twitching and slightly moving around and as I ate it, it tasted so fresh, it was so soft and tender and delicate and had zero sliminess. I also had an ultra sweet scallop and kaisendon which is freshly sliced fish over rice. And trust me, the kaisendon was as fresh as people say, you really get some of the freshest seafood at the seafood market. Once again I exchanged business cards with the owner who was so friendly and welcoming. Back at the hotel room, I tried those $10 strawberries which were crisp, juicy, and worth every last cent. I next had to rush over to the train station to take the local train to Shin Hakodate Station where we would board the 200 mile per hour Shinkansen. The exterior of the train looked so new and modern as it first started running in March of 2016. I was thankful because once again I would be sitting in a green car since I made reservations well in advance. The leg room was great as there was plenty of room for my legs and the seat was also very soft and comfortable. For lunch I enjoyed a train bento or ekiben that I picked up in Hakodate while going through Japan's longest rail tunnel. Anyways, enjoy the following travel sequence to Tokyo. After arriving at Tokyo Station, I had to wait in a line for about 20 minutes before I could get a taxi to my hotel. I stayed at the Hotel Grand Block and I felt like it had a bougie traditional feel to it. The room was really nice and had quite a bit of space and I loved the large sink in the bathroom. However, I didn't have too long to spend at the hotel because then I had to head to Odaiba for dinner. It was definitely something to pass by Tokyo's large skyscrapers at dusk as it gave the train ride a whole new feeling. As we approached the Rainbow Bridge, the sky had a glowing oranginess to it. Of course, the highlight was crossing the Rainbow Bridge at dusk because it was all lit up and looked so nice in a fading light. Of course, you had another great look at Tokyo. I arrived in Odaiba right at sunset and look at that view of the Rainbow Bridge. I took the moment to reflect on the day and I thought it was pretty crazy how far I had traveled in one day and all the amazing things that I had done. Dinner was yakitori at gompachi which I missed out earlier on in the trip. This was my favorite yakitori place on my first trip to Japan so I decided to get a wide variety of skewers. And sure enough, it was just as good as I remembered it. Their meat here is just thoroughly marinated and they really do use good quality charcoal which you can taste which just gives the meat such a nice smoky flavor and all their meat is really high quality and ridiculously juicy. After dinner I had one last look at Odaiba. 
Then it was back on the Yurikomomi line, which was very crowded, probably because it was a Saturday night. It was really crazy to see how crowded Shinbashi Station was as it looked like rush hour. However, the crowdedness was still not as crazy as this tourist I saw. Eventually made it back to the hotel exhausted after a long day of traveling, and another exciting day was ahead of me. Day 15. This is the day I tried Japanese fugu or poisonous pufferfish. But before all that, let me show you what else I did that day. Once again, I started the morning off at the hotel breakfast, which was a bit on a pricey side, but it ended up tasting pretty good, and I think it might have been worth it. Once again, I was back on the subway, and I headed to a viral shop tucked away in a quaint neighborhood. They are famous for their Totoro-shaped cream puffs, and I had seen them all over social media for months leading up to my trip. I'll be honest, at first impression, I wasn't sure if these cream puffs would taste great, because I thought, oh, they're just in the shape of Totoro, and maybe they're just made for Instagram pictures, but they are so much more. I mean, they could just sell these as regular old cream puffs, they're that good. The pastry had a really pleasant airiness to it, and all the creams had such a rich flavor and creaminess to it, and they were also light and fluffy, just like whipped cream. A cup of ice matcha paired with it made for the perfect treat. To burn off the calories I had to go to Kuji Temple which is famous for its thousands of Maneki Neko or bowing cat statues. It was pretty surreal seeing all those cat statues and it was almost like being in a fever dream. Eventually, my time at Godokuchi Temple was up and it was back on a train to lunch. 45 minutes later, I made it to the ramen shop I wanted to go to for lunch, but I couldn't believe my eyes as they were closed for two weeks as they were on vacation. Finally, I found a restaurant with plastic food on display that looked quite good. This was the cheapest meal of my trip. I ordered this lunch set with a gigantic portion of soba and a huge bowl full of rice topped with tonkatsu. Even though it was cheap, it tasted a lot better than anything I could find in California. Then it was off to see a traditional knife shop in Asakusa. Once again, I had to make two subway transfers before arriving at Tarwamachi Station. Eventually arrived at Kapabashi Dori, which is a famous street lined with knife shops. I stopped by Subaya, which is a popular knife shop. They had so many different high quality knives and it was really hard to choose, but after talking to the owner, I finally decided on this knife, which looked really nice and is so sharp. After making a quick stop at the hotel, it was time to try fugu, or the famous pufferfish. Fugu has a reputation for being really dangerous as it was banned multiple times throughout Japan's history, but today it's really safe to eat as only trained chefs are allowed to prepare it. On my last trip to Japan, I tried fugu and I didn't die, so I thought why not share the experience with you all this time. I ordered this multi-course set meal as I wanted to try as many different preparations as possible. I started off with this fugu skin salad and it had a very subtle, refreshing flavor from all the dressing and almost had the texture of cooked squid. Next I had fugu sashimi, which is the most prized way to enjoy fugu, and I thought it had a very pleasant texture. It was very firm and meaty, yet very easy to eat. If you fed this to someone without telling them what it was, they would just say it tastes like a beautiful cut of sashimi, and they would not know that they're eating one of the world's most deadliest fish. Next, they tried the deep fried fugu, which really brought out the natural sweetness of the meat, and it almost tasted like a really fresh piece of cod. Equally delicious was the grilled fugu, which came in a sweet teriyaki sauce, and it was a lot of fun to grill and eat. You can't have a fugu meal without fugu hot pot, and this made the fish really delicate as it boiled in there, and the fish basically just melted in your mouth. The waitress also helped make rice porridge by adding a little bit of rice and egg to the remaining broth and it was so rich and flavorful as it soaked up all the flavor from the fugu and the vegetables. Although eating fugu might scare you, if you're in Japan you should definitely give it a shot. There's literally nowhere else in the world that you can try it. I think you'll be shocked at how tasty it actually is. After dinner I headed to Don Quixote which is a popular chain shop that is gigantic and is almost like if Amazon had a store, there's literally everything there. There was so much to choose from but I just got a whole bunch of different bags of candy as each one was only about $2. I went to bed thankful that night for surviving and enjoying the Fugu experience. Day 16. I took my second to last full day in Japan to visit Hakone. I was back on the bullet train leaving Tokyo, and I had to head to Odawara first. Then we were zipping along the track going through the countryside, and 30 minutes later we made it to Odawara Station. I then decided to buy the Hakone Free Pass which gives free access to all the transportation in Hakone. It was around $35. 
From Odawara Station, I took the local train to Hakone Yamoto Station, where I transferred to that iconic mountain train. You can see lots of greenery from the train, and this is the famous bridge that most people think of first when they think of the journey to Hakone. Another site I was very fortunate to see was thousands of hydrangea along the track. It is from mid-June to around the end of July. There's so many hydrangea plants that are blooming all around the train. There was even a whole station full of hydrangea. Time went by really quick and I already found myself in Hakone. From the station I transferred to the Hakone Tozen cable car and I didn't know it at the time but it fits 250 people so it's pretty crowded. This is no regular train as it's a funicular railway which means it goes up an almost vertical slope which I find kinda crazy and you sort of feel like you're leaning backwards the whole ride. After a long journey I finally found my place I was heading to for lunch Ito Dining by Nobu, and I was really looking forward to it because I've always wanted to dine at one of the legendary Nobu restaurants. I ordered one of the many lunch courses complete with sashimi, soup, salad, grilled A5 wagyu, and even a super pretty dessert. All of the starters were fresh and clean tasting so you could really tell that they were using high quality ingredients and so far the meal was already living up to the Nobu name. The A5 Wagyu really put them over the top, it was such a premium, marbly, fatty cut, and because it's engineered to melt at body temperature, it just literally melts in your mouth. It was so delicate and decadent and rich, all in one bite. Dessert was a milk pudding which was so light and made for the perfect end to the meal. The total price of the meal was only 75 US dollars, which I think is a bargain, considering that you're getting A5 Wagyu and you're eating at a Nobu brand restaurant. From lunch I headed back on the cable car before transferring to the ropeway. We eventually emerged from the trees and crossed over a hell valley like landscape. I then took a short walk around the area, I'm gonna be honest it was kinda disappointing cause it wasn't quite as crazy as hell valley. However if you've never been to hell valley it's still a cool place to check out. Then I headed back on the ropeway to see another popular attraction, the Halcone Sightseeing Cruise. The ride takes place on a pirate ship so I feel like it's a bit touristy, but it's definitely one of the most popular things to do in Hakone. It was so peaceful and serene looking out over the water, but definitely be sure to bring a jacket because even in the summer it does get quite cold and windy. The journey is only 30 minutes long and goes by quite quickly. But now for the story how I almost didn't make it back to Tokyo. Then it was a ride on the Hakone Tozan bus which was really scenic as it went through the mountains. However, I had very little time to relax because I had to figure out how to get back to Tokyo. I soon found myself in a deep dilemma. It was currently about 4.30pm and the bullet train I wanted to catch out of Odawara Station left at 6.14pm so you might ask what's the big deal? The problem is the bus would only take us to Hakone Station so we'd have to get on a train to transfer to Odawara. The train leaving Hakone Station left at 5.39pm. And like I said, it was about 4.30pm on the bus, so you'd think that would be enough time because Google Maps said it would only take 30 minutes to get to the station. However, Google Maps was very wrong with their estimate because there's 28 stops on the bus. And although the bus didn't stop at every stop as you had to request each stop, it still took a really long time. 30 minutes soon turned into 45 minutes, which turned into 55 minutes. Eventually it was 5.32pm and the train left at 5.39pm and we were still stuck on a bus and I didn't know when the stop was but luckily the stop came up about a minute later. That gave me 6 minutes to make it back to the train which I thought might not be enough time because we still had to walk through the station which was bigger than you think it would be. Somehow I managed to put my ticket through the ticket gate and then sprint through the station in 2 minutes so that means I made it onto the train with about 4 minutes to spare. Once I made it to Odawara Station, I had about 20 minutes to get my seat reservation for the bullet train. As soon as I made it to the platform, I got to see a bullet train go by me at full speed, which was really exciting. Eventually, I made it back on my bullet train heading back to Tokyo, and I was exhausted after that rush to the train. On the 30 minute ride back to Tokyo, I looked up a place for dinner, and I found an amazing sushi spot inside a Tokyo station. The question was, would I be able to find it? Thankfully, after asking around for about 15 minutes, I was able to find a spot, and it looked really good. There were so many different types of sushi on their menu, so I was hyped. I got multiple types of fish, and they all looked really colorful and masterfully made. This shop is particularly known for their tuna, and I got lean tuna, seared tuna, chopped tuna spine, and even fatty tuna. 
Not only did they use high quality fish, but it was very affordable, and I loved the wide variety of fish on their menu, and everything was so delicious. If you're at Tokyo Station, it is a little bit hard to find, but you have to check it out. That night I went to bed with a sense of sadness, as the next day would be my last full day in Japan. Day 17 for my last full day in Tokyo, I decided I want to head back to Sakasa, which was my favorite area my first time in Tokyo on the trip. I saw the famous Kaminari Mon gate again, and then I was off to try more street food. The first place I checked out was a mochi shop, and I got the custard mochi which is their most popular item, and it was so pillowy soft, and it really does taste so much better in Japan. I also stopped by this dog shop and picked up a kimono and treats for my dog. Right outside I saw this really interesting looking dog that had glasses on. Then I stopped by for a famous street food in the Sakasa, which are strawberries coated in candy. These are basically just strawberries covered in a thick sugar outside, and it's really crunchy and satisfying to eat. You also can't visit the Sakasa without checking out Sensoji Temple, which is the oldest temple in Tokyo. I made sure to cleanse myself with incense, which is a very popular thing to do. For lunch, I tried out this popular ramen shop in the Sakasa, and I decided to order their spicy miso ramen, and this was my favorite bowl of ramen on a trip. It just had such a rich broth. I love the rich fatty pork in it, and the flavor of it was just out of this world. Then I had way too many desserts, starting off with melon pond, which is a freshly baked bread with a sweet crunchy top, and it almost tastes like a cookie and a bread combined together. Another dessert I really wanted to try in Japan was kakagori, which is basically Japanese shaved ice. It really reminds me of Hawaiian shaved ice but with a lighter texture and unique Japanese flavors such as matcha which I tried. I ordered the kakagori with a little bit of sweet red beans and mochi on the side and it was the perfect addition. It also came with a concentrated matcha syrup on top which really added so much intense bitter flavor. This really made for the perfect summertime treat. The last dessert I tried before leaving Asakusa is taiyaki, which is a traditional Japanese confection. It's basically a fish-shaped waffle with a variety of fillings, but I chose sweet potato, and I thought this place was really great as their waffle wasn't overly sweetened, and all the sweetness just came from the very sweet, sweet potato filling inside. Before leaving Asakusa, I saw the Asahi Beer Building, which really caught my eye. Although I didn't know it at the time, this building is nicknamed the Golden Poo, and I am absolutely serious. The Golden Poo of Asakusa is a real thing. A couple hours later, I was off to dinner to eat with a friend I hadn't seen in 7 years, so I was really looking forward to seeing her again. My friend took us out to eat at this really nice yakitori restaurant, and this is easily the fanciest yakitori that I've ever had. I really enjoyed catching up, and we definitely learned a lot more about each other, and we specifically talked a lot about food. And speaking of food, dinner was delicious, and I think she picked out a great place. Again, I had a great time talking to her. The next time she's in the US, she's gonna try and visit us, and if we find ourselves in Japan again in the near future, we are gonna do our best to meet up again for a meal, cause it was a lot of fun. Just like that, my last full day in Japan came to an end. Day 18 This was technically my last day in Japan, but I left pretty early in the morning and took a taxi to Tokyo Station. From there I took the Narita Express all the way back to Narita Airport to catch my flight back home. This was the craziest 18 days of my life going across Japan and traveling so many miles. I saw so many beautiful sights, from the hustle and bustle of Tokyo, to the tranquility of Miyajima Island, a solemn memorial in Hiroshima, the Wagyu meal of a lifetime in Kobe, the best soft serve ice cream I've ever had in my entire life inside of an airport in Sapporo, Endless flower fields as far as the eye can see in Furano. A Martian-like landscape in the deep depths of Noboribetsu. Sushi in Otoru which was so fresh it changed my outlook on sushi forever. The sweetest crab I've ever eaten and the best seafood meal of my entire life in Hakodate. A beautiful cruise on Lake Oshii in Hakone. And a jaw-dropping sunset over the Rainbow Bridge in the city of Tokyo. I'm impressed and still in shock that I managed to visit all 10 cities I originally set out to see in Japan. The many amazing and welcoming people I met made a trip extra special. Although my trip didn't go perfectly as I didn't love every single food I tried, and I fell asleep on a train not once but twice due to not getting enough sleep, this was still the most memorable trip I've ever taken in the best two and a half weeks of my 18 years on this planet. So I implore you, the next time you're thinking about going on vacation out of the country, choose Japan. 
It'll be an experience you won't ever forget, and you'll want to go back as soon as you can. That being said, I really hope you all enjoyed the video. Make sure if you did to give it a like, and also make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.